she. Welcome to Banging the Can, the Houston sports show that does not apologize for championship rings and tings, presented by Bolin Media. I am your host, Ross Bolin, and literally none of the things I hoped would happen for the Astros at the beginning of this season have come to fruition. It has been a tough, tough batch of baseball to watch thus far, and we're all frustrated as fans, no doubt, so let's talk about it. We can get through this together, Astros fans. We are fine. Or we will be fine. This is fine. Currently, in the midst of a three-game series at home against the Atlanta Braves, the first game of which our boys dropped last night, the Houston Astros are 6-12 at the bottom of the AL West with only the lowly Chicago White Sox, who have only won two games, below them in the American League. Not great. Not great, not what we expected, certainly not what we hoped for. Things have not gone well, and fans have become increasingly impatient and agitated, understandably so. But the question as to why the team has struggled so mightily to start the season, it's fairly simple to answer. It's pretty straightforward. Justin Verlander, Framber Valdez... Jose Urquidy, Luis Garcia. Those are the starting pitchers dealing with injuries that have caused the team to force a bunch of minor league talent they otherwise wouldn't have called up to the big show to face major league hitters. It's really, really hard to win major league baseball games with inadequate starting pitching. Really hard. Everyone knows this. It's obvious. And when you're having to run guys out there who are as green as Spencer Arigetti or Blair Henley, that poor bastard, things are not going to go well. They're just not going to go well. That's where we're at. That's it. It's simple. Like our offense has been spotty, sure, but especially over the past few weeks, put up a lot of runs, still lost a lot of games because we gave up too many runs because our pitching is dog shit. That's, that's it. There's, there's, it's not some crazy complicated thing for us to dissect here or try to solve. There's not even any math involved. It's just the pitching sucks. Therefore, the team kind of sucks. And that's how you get to 6-12. and 12. That's, that's it. On top of that... We all knew Hunter Brown needed to take the next step this season, and he hasn't done that thus far. He's been shitty and unsteady and gotten rocked. Rocked. There was nothing worse than that game Hunter Brown started a few days back where it was like, they need Hunter to go at least six innings because the bullpen is, the bullpen is depleted. We've been, we, we're, we're wearing guys out. And then he didn't make it. Out of the first inning. (laughs) Hunter Brown has been dog shit. That was one of the big things for this season. Looking to him to take the next step. And and, and perhaps if he did that, my hypothesis was that then we would maybe have one of the most elite starting pitching staffs in baseball. When you talk about all the other guys I've already mentioned who are not healthy, uh, if, if they had been healthy. And Hunter Brown had taken the next step. Hunter Brown has not done that. We all hoped J.P. France could be as effective as he was last season in his rookie year, where he stepped up enormously for the team, filled in some gaps as far as, you know, other starting pitching injuries uh, were concerned. That hasn't happened either. Call it a sophomore slump, but J.P. France has not looked nearly as effective as he was in 2023. So again, this really, it isn't all that complicated. You get Justin Verlander back, you get Framber Valdez back, and Arquiti, and eventually Garcia, and I guess we can throw Lance McCullers Jr. on that list. You get all of those guys back, and suddenly you have what is inarguably a competent, at worst, competent starting rotation with room to spare. But when you're short an entire starting rotation worth of pitchers due to injury, your four best starters, with the exception of Christian Javier, that's a shitstorm. That's a shitstorm. And all you can do when you're in the middle of a shitstorm is try to hold it together until you have a complete team again, or at least something that slightly resembles a complete team. And we don't have that right now. And then... Once you get there, you have to hope that Verlander still has gas in the tank. 
that Framber can get his head screwed on straight again, and that everyone can avoid being hurt at the same fucking time, as far as starting pitching goes, for the rest of the season. So until we get to that place, it's going to be tough sledding. It's going to be a rough ride. And the unrealistic expectations of our fan base, our extremely spoiled fan base, especially the sect of the fan base that is active on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, you gotta, they got to they gotta be lowered. Expectations got to be lowered. All right? This is, is it what we wanted? No. Is it fun? Fuck no. But this is it. This is what we got. Let's not, let's not make it more miserable than it already is by bitching and moaning like, oh my God, what are they doing? What do you mean, what are they doing? They don't have any pitchers. There's no pitching. You got to have pitchers. It's fucking baseball. Without pitchers, it doesn't really matter all that much how, what the hitters do because there's no fucking pitching to keep the other team from scoring 20 goddamn runs. So, if nothing else... The first 20 games of the season should remind us as fans just how difficult it is to win in this league, to remind us just how special this seven-year run of ALCS appearances and two World Series titles has been. Uh, Because the Strohs, look, another thing to consider here, they've had a very tough schedule to start the year. We've played mostly playoff teams, all right? And getting in that 0-4 hole, losing all four to the Yankees at home to start the year, Kind of set the tone and should have let us know where we were at. I think a lot of us wanted to maintain optimism and think we could kind of bounce back over the next few weeks. That hasn't really happened. We've been up and down, up and down. Thank God we won that home three-game home series against the Rangers last week. But, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is what we've got for now. It's going to be a battle. And I don't know. I don't know what, what I, all I know is this. Our expectations have to be lower than what they were before the season started. Because we didn't know all these fucking guys were going to be hurt. We didn't know, we knew Verlander was out. We knew Luis Garcia was out until June, July-ish, right? McCullers Jr. as well, allegedly. But, we didn't know we'd lose Framber. We didn't know we'd have to be calling up dudes from the minor leagues every two fucking days to come start because we're out of pitchers, Right? But they've been up against it to start this season. No one can argue otherwise. Things have not gone well. Uh, I'm not making excuses. They have to be better, especially at the plate with runners in scoring position. They have to be better, no doubt. But uh, there's been some bad luck in there as well. And yeah, this has been a fucking nightmare. (laughs) It's been a fucking nightmare. I'm miserable. And no, there isn't. I don't. This is important. Pay attention. I don't think there's anything management or ownership could have done to avoid what has happened here. Like, what did you want Dana Brown to do? Use a crystal ball to see that Framber would go down and that J.P. France would fall off and that Hunter Brown would go backward? You couldn't have prejudged any of those things. Maybe Hunter Brown, but not the other two. Relief pitching hasn't exactly been what we all thought it would be either. Like, remember going into this season now we were like, oh man, all we have to do is get to the seventh inning and these fucking games are over between Brian Abreu, Ryan Presley, and Josh Hader. And that hasn't really been the case, has it? Hader has been not his best. We have not gotten his the best version of Josh Hader. Okay, Abreu has been off his game. Presley struggled with the transition away from closer for a few games. Uh, seems to kind of be getting his shit back together now. I, I just, I don't really think you can put any of this on Dana Brown. As much as I would love to have a scapegoat, and I really fucking would, trust me, I just don't think that's fair. I'm not defending him. I'm not some Dana Brown stan. I don't care. If you want to shit on him, do your thing. Shit all over him. I'm just saying I don't think... You can really put this on Dana Brown or Jim Crane and his refusal to spend because he literally did. Like, he, he did. He wouldn't got Josh Hader. He spent. He spent some money. Yes, we lost a lot of relief pitchers. Yes, it looks bad in hindsight that we let four guys walk, like, however many goddamn hundreds of innings that was that we allowed to leave in free agency over the course of the offseason. But again, like, we didn't know starting pitching would be in shambles the way that it has been. Otherwise, you like, again... You could sell anybody on that whole Brian Abreu, Ryan Presley, Josh Hader closing rotation. 
You could have. And that's what Dana Brown and, and Jim Crane clearly counted on. It didn't work out that way, but I'm just saying, I don't think you can put it on Dana Brown or Jim Crane the way this has gone. It's very bad luck. It's just tough to swallow because we kind of had bad luck during the regular season last year as far as like, you know, Jose Altuve was out to start the year because he broke his fucking thumb in the stupid World Baseball Classic and you had uh, Jordan Alvarez out in stretches and it just seemed like we never really had the whole team all playing together and Jose Abreu was dog shit. Of course, that's happening again. I just don't think any of us expected this year to be kind of the same but different and that's what it's been so far and it's not fun. That's the problem. Is it's really not fun to watch loss after loss after loss and only get six wins as far as we are into the year, you know, 12 losses or whatever, twice as many L's as W's. For this team to be second to last in the AL kind of shocking it's kind of shocking considering we've made the American League Championship Series every fucking year since 2017 so if you have to pick somebody for this to be on though this shit is on the guys with the bats and the balls in their fucking hands every game it's not Dana Brown it's not Jim Crane it's the team they gotta go out and get results because this is the team for better or for worse and they have been getting beat Simple as that. And they they might be up against it, but you know what great teams do? What truly great teams do? They find a way to win no matter what, right? So if they want to be that, they have to do this. It's on the team to get their shit together before it is too late and before the season is too far gone, which with every passing day seems like more of a real possibility that would make me burn the recording studio to the ground. Renell Blanco threw a no-hitter, though. That was cool. That was cool. We'll always have that. That was tight. That was neat. We got a real one in Renell. That's for sure. That's a positive. That's a win. That's something we can put on our old belt loop. Another notch on the bedpost. I don't know where I'm going with this analogy, but Renell Blanco was sick. That, that no-hitter was awesome. He's been pretty rock, rock solid. So, again, if you get the rest of these fucking injured bozos back, and then you've got, like, an excess of good starters because of Renel Blanco and, you know, uh, maybe one of these kids we've pulled up from the minors will work at some point. Forrest Whitley got called up today. That's where we're at. <laughs> that's, how, that's how desperate things have gotten. Uh, I'll read you a little bit about Forrest from The Athletic. Forrest was selected 17th overall in the 2016 draft, signed for $3.148 million bonus, uh, As The Athletic puts it, he was once hailed as the Astros' next homegrown ace. But injuries, ineffectiveness, and a 50-game drug suspension before the 2018 season derailed the dream. In 2019, he was considered one of, if not the, uh, best pitching prospect in Major League Baseball. So it says, now he will offer a fresh arm to a bullpen in desperate need of it because none of Houston's other optionable relievers have been down long enough to be recalled without putting someone on the injured list. Whitley was the only realistic possibility for this promotion. So that's where we're at. Forrest Whitley finally making his major league jump. And here's some stats. I'll give you some stats. Some of you are numbers people. You like numbers. Here's some stats. The team, the Astros, third in batting average. That sounds good. Fifth in on-base percentage. That's not bad. Fifth in home runs. Wow. Sixth in slugging percentage. OMG. Thirteenth in run scores. Eh, Run scored. Eh, Like I said, runners in scoring position. Been a major problem. There was also a problem last year. But none of those stats would lead you to believe the team is 6-12. and But they are. Because they're 28th in batting average against... And 28th in walks plus hits per inning pitched. There are only 30 teams. In case you're wondering. They're 28th in those two pitching categories. And uh, that's it. So the problem, again, pretty straightforward. Pitching has been shit. And pitching has been shit because we have a bunch of starters out. And the scabs we've brought in have been green guys without a chance in hell. And the scabs we relied on last year, like J.P. France, and you can throw Hunter Brown in there, I guess. They've been bad. And that is the story so far this season. Hunter Brown has an ERA of, wait for it, 16.43. J.P. France has an ERA of 8.22. Josh Hader has an ERA of 9.39. Ryan Presley has an ERA of 9.53. Spencer Arigetti, 11.57. So, 
What do we say? It's tough to win baseball games without competent starting pitching or closing pitching or any pitching. Just pitching. Pitching. You need pitchers. That's why pitchers are paid so well. That's why they're so important and talked about. And we don't have any of them currently doing a good job. So we stink. And because I like to keep things at least sort of on the sunny side here, let's talk about some positives. Altuve has been raking. He's batting uh, 4.03 with 29 hits, 7 RBIs, and leads the team with 5 home runs. Jose Altuve, Mr. Dependable. He is that dude still. Thank the, the baseball got thank the fuck Christ because this we needed we needed something to root for and Altuve has given us something to root for. Alvarez has been himself for the most part. He's hitting 299, 12 RBIs, uh, one behind Tucker, but four home runs. You know, he's Jordan Alvarez. I've liked seeing him in the two hole. Um, although we still have all these issues with runners in scoring position, I don't know what the answer is there. That that is one place I'd like to see Joe Espada do some reconfiguring in terms of the batting lineup to try to get some more RBIs because Jesus, uh, Kyle Tucker leading the team in RBIs with 13, four bombs. He's hitting 257, turning it on as of late though, it would seem, uh, Yanni or Diaz has hit well. Victor Caratini looks like a nice little addition. couple of hitting catchers we've got now, which is fucking weird after years and years of having absolutely no hitting at the catching position. Um, but yeah, look, Long season, everybody knows that. It sucks having to say it again. But um, it's a long regular season. Lots and lots and lots of baseball left to be played. You would obviously like to see the dudes dig out of this hole sooner rather than later. 6-12 and 12 is, is a dog shit record. Being second to last in the American League is inexcusable with this roster. It's absolutely asinine with this roster, I would go so far as to say. And I don't think it will stay that way. I think it's insane if you're sitting there like we're gonna we're gonna be like this all year. That's that's crazy talk. You you know that's not gonna happen. You know that's in your heart of hearts. You know that's not gonna happen. Stop being that negative. That's insane. Um, I think things will get better. Now, how much better they will get is yet to be determined. But I know we will get there, and everything will be okay at some point, probably. When it comes time to perform, you don't always have your best stuff. Just like in baseball. So it goes in the bedroom, especially when you're getting up there in age. Performing at your peak every time is challenging. Thankfully, today's episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Fellow sports fans, remember the days when you were always ready to throw down? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence when it's game time in the bedroom. Listen up. Blue Chew. Dot com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets in a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. No weird visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in discreet packaging, I would note. I've used Blue Chew's tablets several times and felt like I was in a time machine, transformed back into the professional hitter of yesteryear that I once was. So if you're looking for more confidence, if you're looking to make a lasting impression, if you're in the market for the best can banging of your life... Blue Chew could be the answer for you, too. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special offer, special deal for the can bangers. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code BTC at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code BTC to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast and supporting the can bangers in our bedroom performance. All right, let's move on to the Rockets. A little end-of-season performance review. They obviously fell short of making the play-in tournament, but finished the season at 500, 41 and 41. Right there, clean numbers. 500, third in the Southwest Division behind Dallas and New Orleans, who are both competent uh, playoff-worthy teams. All in all, massively successful season, frustrating one at different stretches to be sure, but all in all, like this is what we wanted to see. It was very, very, very unlikely we were going to drop from jump from the basement up into like actual playoff contention 
in a one season stretch, that's almost impossible to do. It almost never happens. Um, but to do this, to jump up as many games as we did and get to 500 and and have had a chance that last month of, year, of the year to make a push for the plan, that was really exciting. Um, the last couple of weeks were obviously extremely disappointing. But like I said on the show a few weeks back, I thought the guys kind of ran out of gas. Um, that was that was tough to, to string that many wins together in a, in a last ditch effort to make the playoffs. Takes a lot out of you. Basketball is exhausting. Um, but let's let's kind of give some performance review stuff here. Ime Odoka, new head coach, first year. I don't know if you, I I guess if we had made the playoffs, I would have given him an A plus. So I'll say A minus because I saw everything I wanted to see from Ime. He clearly knows how to handle young talent. He knows how to motivate the young guys. He knows how to teach them how to be professional basketball players, professional NBA players. He, he, I think he's, he's the guy. He's the guy. Made the right hire there. Raphael Stone should be given some credit. Some credit. Yet to be determined how much. But at least some credit for that hire of Ime Udoka. And uh, yeah, Ime, this is the, that was it. That was what we wanted, man. Thank you. Good shit. Great shit. That was a good season. Great first season. And uh, I, I genuinely believe he can build from here. And then he can get these guys up to the next level next season. So, Ime Odoka, I don't think I have to say much more. A-. minus. Uh, Fred Van Vliet, maybe the only A+, plus, but definitely an A+. Plus. Look, we knew we were getting a competent leader, point guard, veteran, championship uh, caliber guy who who knows what type of work ethic you have to have and what type of mentality you have to have to be successful in the NBA and win at a high level. Um, and he was all of that. He was all that and then some. I thought, I, I mean, he was a much better scorer than I imagined he would be. Um, he handled himself with poise literally every game. I, don't, I can't think of a time he lost his cool. It's possible that he did at one point or another and I forgot, but I can't remember him losing his cool. He was fantastic with the young guys. Um, that was, that was, look, I talked shit at different points in the year about how like Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks were, it didn't make sense to have veterans that couldn't get you to the next level by themselves. And I was wrong. I was wrong. Hands up. I was wrong. Uh, Fred Van Vliet was awesome. I think him and Dylan Brooks, mostly Fred, facilitated a lot of the growth that you see and were able to help Ime Odoka steer these guys in the right direction and just also run a very efficient offense. And he was better than you would think on defense as well. Uh, so FVV gets a, an A plus for the year. Jalen Green, I'm going to say B plus, B plus, because that pre All Star break, it was a long stretch of extremely disappointing play from Jalen Green. We finally saw what we expected, what we expect from this kid um, after the All Star break in this last few months stretch of the year, last couple months stretch of the season. He's 22 years old. You've seen the talent. The raw talent is there. It seems like the work ethic and the drive are starting to set in and that Ime Udoka should probably be given some credit there. Uh, Jalen Green, I wish, it had, I wish he had been more consistent, especially in the first half of the season, but he wasn't. It is what it is. B plus, B minus, somewhere in there. The guy's really, really great. He just he needs to find a way to stay more productive consistently throughout the course of the year. He could also improve some defensively still. Offensively, he's got everything you could possibly ask for an offensive superstar to have in their bag, and uh, we'll see how he grows next year. Alperin Shingun obviously went down with injury, missed a bunch of time at the end of the season. Very unfortunate. I think we would have made the play in had Alperin stayed healthy. You could also argue that we wouldn't have gone on the run we did if Alperin was still healthy, so it's tough to say. Um, I love Shingun. I think he's great. He seemed like he was continuing to develop his game even further as the season went on. And uh, then we lost him to injury, and it's hard to evaluate his season on the whole for that reason. But I'll say the same, you know, B, B plus. B plus for Alperin. And I hope that he is able to get healthy in the offseason and then continue to grow as a basketball player so that we see better iterations of him and Jalen Green to start the season next year. Amen Thompson, A+. Plus. I did not expect this dude to contribute this season. Like It's just rare that a rookie has much of a footprint on the game. He left a big footprint. Defensively, this dude is much more talented than I realized, but frankly, I don't think he got enough credit for how good he was offensively this season. Like He, he was a good finisher at the rim. Um, he seemed to have really good timing, be able to read the passing lanes well, good cutter, and not a bad rebounder. So Eamon Thompson was a big surprise for me. And I think if you... Like, if you're ranking these dudes in terms of like, where's the future? It's Jalen and Alperin at the top. 
And then Eamon Thompson is right the fuck there. He's right there. Cam Whitmore probably a couple slots down. But Eamon Thompson was the most uh, surprising player on the Rockets team for me this year. I thought he was fantastic. Uh, Dylan Brooks, C, C, just a C. No plus or minus, just a C. I don't know. He kind of did what we thought he would do, right? Hot start, set the bar way too high for himself at the beginning of the season. I don't think anybody really thought that would hold, but it was fun watching him get tossed out of games and pick up technical fouls and go go to bat for our young stars in terms of uh, uh, you know physicality um, and being an enforcer. I like Dylan Brooks. Uh, I think he definitely gets a bad rap in terms of like Dylan the villain and all that nonsense. I think he's a fun personality and player, but he didn't do anything to really shock me or surprise me in the way of the whole season. So um, all in all, I just think he did what he's supposed to do. He's just, it was a C. He gets paid a lot of money to be a C. I'll say that. But uh, and frankly, he got embarrassed defensively more times than I would have liked to see. So he gets a C. Jabari Smith Jr. C plus could have been better, could have been worse. Didn't really blow my mind. Had a few games here or there when I was like, "Holy shit, Jabari's really coming into his own." And then he would kind of backslide. Felt a little bit like Jalen Green has in the past in that way, where I'm like, "I can see the ceiling. My expectations for you are high." Because I can see the ceiling, you don't seem to be able to see it, and you're fiddling around much lower than the ceiling, and it's pissing me off. That's how I felt watching him. So, Jabari Smith Jr., yeah, it is what it is. Those are the only players I'm going to rate for now. Raphael Stone uh, and his assistant GM, Eli Whitus, Wittis, whatever, signed a multi-year contract extension, apparently. That was reported on today by the old Woj and Shams and all the NBA inside people. Um, so if you were one of the people like me that was really curious what would happen with Raphael Stone and his contract situation and whether or not he was our long-term GM, it turns out the answer is yes. Uh, he is going to be our long-term GM. I, I think the jury is still out on this guy in terms of building a competent championship contender. In terms of building a competent altogether basketball team, I think he has proven that he can do that job. But that's not where we're trying to go. Middle of the pack, fighting for the play-in, that's not the end goal, right? So I think it's yet to be determined if Raphael Stone has the stones to take this thing to the next level. I think Steven Adams is an interesting trade in in the midseason here. That we'll, we'll see how that pans out next year. I think we'll obviously have other offseason moves that occur. It'll be interesting to see what he does. I think if he trades either of Jalen Green or Alperin Shingun, I'm all the way back out on this fucking guy. Uh, That better not happen. There have been a lot of rumors that he's trying to get one of them or the other out the door. I will lose my goddamn mind if he does that. Um, But yeah, they got contract extensions, him and his assistant GM. So, you know, clearly Fertitta is happy with what he's seen from Raphael Stone to some degree. And uh, I don't really have much reason not to trust Tillman. We've only seen him really through a tanking phase as an owner. So what he's able to build up out of this will be how we judge him. Um, And Raphael Stone is the guy he has tied himself to. So we will see what comes from that pairing in terms of ownership and general management. But uh, yeah, the expectations for next season are pretty simple. I mean, we're, we're right back up where we've talked a lot about the Texans and the Rockets and, their, and these new eras that they've created, where now the Texans made this huge jump, and especially with all the moves this offseason, like the, it's the AFC Championship or bust. For the Rockets, it's, I, I think, playoffs or bust. And I guess play-in would be fine, the play-in to the playoffs, but if we make the play-in, I expect that we win the play-in and make the playoffs. That's what I'm saying. For next season. It's a lot of talent. The first year head coach excuse won't be flying anymore. Dependent on health, we need our main guys to be healthy and able to play. That should go without saying. Um, But they have enough on this roster. They've spent enough money. They've got enough talent. They've got enough veteran leadership. They've got Steven Adams coming in as another enforcer. I think they have an identity that they uh, effectively installed with Ime Udoka, where toughness is a huge part of this brand of basketball that they're playing. And I expect next season for them to be in the playoffs. We've waited long enough. We did enough years of losing. This one, we're in the middle of the pack, which is fine. It's great jump, great season, very successful, overall productive. But we're all done fucking around here. And I think the team obviously feels that way as well. The team wants to make the playoffs every year. But like as fans watching from the outside, looking in 
and judging where we're at, there is no reason that this squad shouldn't be in the playoffs next year. There is not a reason. When you look at the coaching we have now, the leadership on this team, the young talent and their growth over the course, especially of the back half of the season, but really over the past two years on the whole, got to make the playoffs next year. That's the expectation. So somebody tell Raphael Stone and Ime Odoko that, that that's what I said because I think they take what I say very seriously. Very, very, very seriously. That will do it for today's show. Remember, every episode of Banging the Can is available in full video on YouTube.com slash app Banging the Can. For those of you who are listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, if you'd prefer to watch, go to YouTube.com slash app Banging the Can and subscribe. If you're already on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. I don't know which side of the screen they're on. Everything's reversed. It's, it, just hit them both. And then comment, if you would, as well. I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on the situation with the Astros, the slow start to the season, if you can call it that. It's more like just a dog shit start. The Rockets in this season and how things went. And uh, I'll comment back. I'll reply. Um, if you comment in the comment section down below, it would mean a lot to me. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, rate and review, all that good stuff. And on that note, please share the most unapologetic Houston sports show in existence with your friends and family. We're at Banging the Can on all the social media platforms. Follow us, like our stuff, share our stuff, support our sponsors. Today we obviously have a new one, BlueChew.com. Use code BTC to try BlueChew free. When you use that promo code BTC at BlueChew.com, just pay $5 shipping to receive your first month for free. And uh, yeah, check out my startup, Bolin Media by going to BowlingMedia.com. If you're an F1 fan, we got a great F1 show. YouTube.com slash at Formula Bone. Not Formula One, Formula Bone, with a B in front of the O. Formula Bone, where you can catch Jared J-Bone, Boris Lowe, breaking down every single race, all F1 season long. He does a fantastic job. Follow at Formula Bone on all the social media platforms as well. It's also available in audio on the podcast platforms. Subscribe, rate, review. Uh, if you love TV and movies, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, currently covering Shogun Season 1 from Hulu slash FX. Coming up in June, though, we'll be doing House of the Dragon Season 2. Tune in, hang out, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. If you're watching House of the Dragon, you watch it with us. Subscribe, rate, review. It's available wherever you get banging the can, including on YouTube. Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. And what else? Uh, oh, the Ross Bolin Podcast, where I do a little bit of comedy, some mental health stuff. Talk about life. It's the random things that I don't discuss on, on this show or on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. I talk about them on the Ross Bolin podcast, so go check that out. I'm Ross Bolin. You can follow me on Twitter, X, or Instagram, at WR Bolin. I'll be back next week. Hopefully, God, hopefully things go better for the Astros between now and then. Uh, Rockets fans, it was a fun ride this season. We're doing it, I think. I think we're doing it. Texans fans, it'll be football season soon enough. Five months? So far away. Really need the Astros to get their shit together. Until next time, H-Town, stay down.